So, yeah, I'm not going to start with an anecdote about Bertrand because I'm going to do that this evening. Um, and instead, I'm going to talk about, so, well, Category 5, Donuts and Thomas invariants. And it's joint work with uh, Julian Holstein and Marco Roballo, who's in here somewhere. Um, and so, okay, let's just uh, start with, uh, I mean, fixing your uh, minds on things. So, by this, it's going to be a smooth and proper um, variety of dimension 3 over C, and maybe call it uh, Y. And Calabriao means that it's oriented, so you have a trivialization of the uh, canonical bundle. Okay, and so we'll see where this comes into play uh, in five minutes or so. And what are Donuts and Thomas invariants? Well, uh, the idea is that you want to count uh, sheaves on your Calabriao threefold Y, and in order to count those sheaves, counting sheaves on y. And in order to count those sheaves, what you compute actually is some volume of the moduli space. Uh, so this is the volume of, of this m. And this m is going to be some moduli space, uh, so typically the moduli space of coherent sheaves on y. Uh, and in order to have this uh, well defined, and you have to impose some conditions on your sheaves. So typically, a stability condition, maybe a fixed determinant. This is not going to be relevant for, for my talk, but just for background. Um, and the point and the relation with derived geometry, which, well, somehow is an important topic of this conference, apparently. So uh, the point is that this doesn't behave well because the moduli space you have here is non-smooth. And one way to say that in terms of derived geometry is to say that you have to replace this moduli space by a derived version. And so this comes as, uh, yeah, as a derived stack. And in terms of, of enriched invariant, this means that you actually integrate not against the class of M, but against what's called the virtual class, which, well, you can get from the derived structure. Uh, historically, it was not defined like that, of course. Um, okay, so what we're going to focus on is a study of this moduli space and more specifically of some structures uh, it carries. So the structure it carries is, comes from a, I mean, was established by, well, a theorem of, well, so for people in the crowd, so Pontef, Toen, Back here. Oh, sorry, should I put the. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Ozzy. Uh, sorry, so yeah. Yeah, it changes the theorem. Um, and the statement is that, well, such a moduli space, I mean, this moduli space here, uh, carries uh, what's called a minus one shifted symplectic structure, and I'll explain what it is in a second. So this M, so let's call this one M. So M carries a minus one shifted symplectic structure. Okay, so what this means is, well, symplectic structure is a two form, right? So I want a two form. I look at the tangent of M. Because M is actually a derived stack, I have a tangent complex. Um, and I want a two-form, so I'm up like so, choose a sheaf of function, and it has to be shifted, so I just add a shift. And in this instance, um, this, and, well, I have to add that this data has to be, this form has to be closed, which is an extra data, and it has to be non-degenerate. Uh, which means that it induces uh, equivalence between the tangent and its dual, the cotangent complex. Uh, okay, and so in this instance, this, this duality here is induced by said duality. Um, so here you have F, a Korean sheaf, 
on Y, maybe satisfying uh, my, my constraints uh, sigma over there. Um, but it's not necessary at this point. I can drop it uh, all the way. Uh, the tangent here, which you can compute at this point, is going to be the ring of endomorphisms of F, uh, the derived ring of endomorphisms of F, which is, which is a shift of one. And this you can express as, well, the global sections on Y of F dual tensor F, so endomorphism, the endomorphism sheaf of F, so with my shift of one. And then using C duality, because this guy is self-dual, uh, I can get that this is the same thing as this. And the shift here becomes minus two, I think. Uh, and the difference here is exactly the three, which is the dimension of my variety. Okay. And this means what? Well, this is the same as a dual of that, and with a shift of minus one. So. Okay. So it's really sad duality that makes this uh, a symplectic structure. Okay, um, so what is the content of this talk actually? So the goal is going to be to study those structures more than actual Donaldson and Thomas invariants, so my title is a bit, uh, could be yeah, a bit of a lie, but um, the goal is to understand how to categorize Donaldson and Thomas invariants, so how to construct Um, well, more refined invariants than the numbers you could get by computing those volumes. Um, so, more refined invariants. Well, of well things that look like that. So, explicitly minus one shifted symplectic things. So, yeah, I derived this stack, but actually we will at some point reduce to the case of schemes, derived schemes. Uh, and what kind of invariants could you actually uh, look at? So typically what we can obtain is something like a previous sheaf, uh, which was, uh, so, which was constructed by, so, Brave, Boussy, Dupont, Joyce, Zendroy. Um, and we could try to do something more, something like uh, sheaves of categories. And this is what I will focus on as an example later. And you could do uh, yeah, other, other invariants. And, uh, I'll explain exactly what you need to construct invariants uh, from a specific perspective. Okay, so here is my plan. First, I explain the strategy. Two, I explain what the indet indeterminacies are. And then I'm going to talk about the Darboux stack. Okay. So first, the strategy. And the strategy, uh, well, it's not really, it's not a new idea, right? This was uh, uh, way long before me. I can't really trace it back. I don't know exactly where, where it first, uh, in whose mind it first occurred, but uh, the idea is to say that such an object uh, as the moduli space of Korean sheaves is locally uh, of the form of a critical locus. And the, the theorem I'm going to use in this instance is, so what we often call the Darboux lemma, 
and is due to Brav, Boussy, and Joyce. Um, and the origin of is Witten. Is Witten. Oh, okay. So, thank you. Um, and the statement here, so this is, a, I mean, most uh, evolved form I, I, I know, but there, there's plenty of results that go into this direction before that. Uh, and so, statement is that any minus one shifted symplectic uh, derived stack is locally, so maybe Artin, yeah, whatever the definition you put in here, I guess you have to assume some geometricity, um, is locally of the form And so in terms of derived geometry uh, of the form, the, the critical locus of a function, but actually the derived critical locus of a function. Uh, so where, so u uh, to a1, you have a function f. Here, this is a smooth scheme. You can also assume a fine. Uh, your function could be anything, right? You don't have any kind of assumption on the function itself, it's a regular function. Uh, and this here means the derived critical locus which means the zero, the zero locus uh, of, well, df, right, which is a section on u of the cotangent bundle. Uh, what do you mean? Locally could be et al. locally if you want to do a stack is your question, right? So, so Zariski locally if, if you start from a scheme, but then you could do et al. locally for stacks. Um, okay, uh, so the strategy is well to say, okay, I know what those objects, minus one shifted symplectic stacks, look like locally. They look like a critical locus on something. So locally, I could find such pairs, u and a function. And what I want to do is say I can take invariance of those pairs, an invariant of uf that somehow is supported on the critical locus, and glue it into something global on my minus one shifted symplectic stack. OK? So this is exactly what we'll do on the next board. Okay, so the idea is to take local singularity invariance of pairs uf uh, and glue them to get invariance of my n. Okay, so from now, yeah, maybe I should stop calling it m. From now, I could replace m by any minus one shifted syntactic stack or something. Right, I don't have to be in this specific situation over there. Okay, so what kind of invariance can you want to look at? So, local singularity invariance of uf, um, and here some global invariance of uh, minus one symplectic. derived stack. Yeah. Okay, so well, what is the, maybe the first singularity invariance you ever learned of is probably the Milner number. And well, Milner 
Um, and maybe, I mean, the first definition is for most functions. So here we have any function, so you need to do a bit, a bit more than that. But you have a renormalized version that does the trick. And the point is that you can construct from that a global invariant of minus one shifted symplectic derived stacks, which mu m, so it's going to be a function, a z-valued function on m, and at this point, if I write something like that, the derived structure doesn't matter at all anymore, right? So you could really think of it as the a map from the underlying uh, Artin stack, and this is uh, the Behrens function. So of course, uh, it was not constructed through derived geometry, right? It was constructed in 04, I think. Um, and what's important about this function is that you can recover the actual numerical invariants that I wrote over there. So the Donaldson Thomas invariants can be recovered as some weighted Euler characteristic of this function. Okay, so from there you actually recover Donaldson Thomas invariants. Yes, yeah, correct, so that's correct, great, right. uh, but yeah. symmetric though. Yeah. Actually, the definition is, is more general, like the, the definition is for very, very general stacks, and it happens to, to, to compute the right thing if you have a symmetric perf uh, perfect obstruction theory. The stack only depends on, on the thing catches the spin. There's no extra data. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the theorem is that oh, it coincides with these. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so okay, you can get uh, back your Donaldson Thomas invariants with this this uh, idea. Uh, you can want to look at other invariants here. So another thing you can do is take vanishing cycles. So vanishing cycles, what they are? So in this case is uh, a perverse sheaf. So maybe P U F, which is a perverse sheaf on the critical locus, and yeah, again, whether I consider or not the derived structure doesn't matter here. So you have a perverse sheaf on the critical locus. A period's a perverse sheaf on you, but it uh, is supported on the critical locus, so here you go. And um, this you can glue uh, to what we call Joyce's perverse sheaf. And so that's what was done in the, so the Braff, Boussy, Dupont, Joyce, Sandro paper I mentioned earlier, and also uh, in a paper of Keen and Lee uh, about the same time. Um, and so what this is here is, uh, I don't know, do I have a notation for that? PM, which is something that lives, that is a previous sheaf uh, over M. And now what I want to do is, oh yeah, uh, sorry. Here I need some extra uh, data to actually do that. So there's an abstraction class to this gluing. And the abstraction class, the vanishing of this abstraction class means the data of uh, an orientation which I will uh, explain more later. And let me, uh, oh, maybe I can finish it here. Another invariant we might look at, and uh, we will look at, is uh, matrix factorization. So I'll explain a bit later what they are, but they are another uh, in singularity invariants of functions, matrix factorizations. And the question is, okay, can we glue it? Is there an orientation data here that I have to uh, assume? And the answer is, of course, yes, from this perspective, because you can, whatever you do, you should be able to recover uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, what's up there here. So here, what you should get is a sheaf of categories, and if you take a periodic homology, you should get back uh, the previous sheaf. And you can also go back from here to here by taking the other characteristic. 
Okay. And so, okay, we want to do that. And well, what we want to do is actually understand what invariants can you glue and under which, uh, and what is the obstruction of gluing any given invariant you can think of. So you could, you could add things on the list uh, on the left. And, and we can discuss it later if you want. Okay. So now, this leads me to the main theorem. So, for myself, Holstein, and Robalo, which, well, paper is being finalized. Um, and the answer is, saying that, yes, you can glue matrix factorizations up to the vanishing of, uh, up to some orientation data, but the orientation data is a priori a bit more evolved than what you had uh, before. So I'm gonna state it like this, is that matrix factorizations glue up to the vanishing of, well, I have a class alpha, which is gonna be some class in etar cohomology of M with values in Z mod two. I'm gonna have a class beta, which is gonna live in H two. And I'm gonna have a class gamma, which is gonna live in H three. And if I write it like that, it's not quite correct. Uh, because there's one thing that we don't know yet, but I have to add something here. Uh, so, yeah, here. It's at least in non commutative motifs. And I explain. Uh, later where the problem comes from uh, and why you need to go to non commutative motives, it is not such a big deal because there are, I mean, a lot of invariants you can take from this uh, gluing in non commutative motives, right? Any realization uh, is going to give you some invariants you can glue. And second half of the theorem, I guess, is that we also recover uh, BDDJS and Kim Lee uh, sheaf up to, well, beta equals zero. Okay, so we have three classes here and only one here, which the vanishing of which is my orientation data. And in, in this case, uh, uh, beta equals zero is the same as the existence of a square root of the canonical bundle of, of n. Okay, so my orientation data is the data of the square root of the canonical bundle. Is it getting this as a non-commutative motive less than constructing this sheet as some motive sheet? I mean, no. Okay, you can realize a non-commutative motive to motives. Use the kind of folded charge filtration. You, no, no. No, no, no. And you can't recover the Z filtration. Like you'll use the two periodization of the run, right? Oh, yeah, but already there. Even if you have the entire sheaf, you can only get the two periodization. I think what you meant is that from the non-commutative motif, you can recover a, a U module in. Yes. So it's like a two periodization. Yeah, yeah, sure. But, but you can't recover the Hodge filtration on vanishing homology, like the full Hodge filtration. Uh, some two periodization of that, I guess. Um, okay, so, what time is it? Oh, good. Okay, so the goal is to give, explain to you how uh, we can prove this, this theorem. Uh, I'm gonna try to describe to you the classes here as well and what, why are they here. Uh, it's something quite remarkable already that, so matrix factorizations is like a, 
I mean, it's, it's, it's something, it's an infinity category, um, two, periodic, two periodic stable infinity category. And in particular, gluing them sh should require an infinite amount of, of obstruction vanishing. And it turns out that only three of them are necessary, which is quite, uh, I mean, I was amazed. Um, okay, and so let me try to explain to you where they come from and describe what the indeterminacy Uh, what they are. Um, yes. Uh, we can talk about this later. So, so the the the, the for four folds, what you get is a minus two shifted symplectic structure, and the description, the local description, is a bit more subtle than that. Okay, um, but uh, like the strategy should also give you something. I haven't looked at the specific invariants you would get here, the specific obstruction classes you would get there. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, the, 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 the local model is not just a function on something, right? So what even would you put as metric factorization is not clear. I mean, I'm sure you can cook up something, but I haven't thought of it so much. Okay. Um, yeah, so first let me tell you uh, in a very short nutshell what matrix factorizations are. So if I have a function u, a function f on some uh, smooth scheme u, um, I can associate to that, so matrix factorizations on u, and what those are, what this is, is, is the category. Um, of pairs of vector bundles and with two maps, A and B, going in opposite directions. And what you want is that the composition of A and B is a multiplication by F and the composition of B and A is a multiplication by F, right? So you are factorizing the, well, scalar matrix F in two different ways. That's why it's called matrix factorizations. And of course, you have to take care of some homotopy equivalences into that, so uh, you have to mod out by something, and what you get here is actually, uh, so yeah, like a stable infinity category, uh, and it happens to be two periodic because, uh, well, you can imagine that you shift by one by swapping the two, and if you shift by two, you get back to the same thing. Um, okay, and the point is that this is actually supported uh, on the critical locus, so you can see it as a sheaf on the critical locus, and maybe even with a flat connection, I'm not going to go into the details. So, what are my indeterminacies? Well, uh, okay, let's just do a board. Let me take a various pairs uf, and uh, part of the statement here if I can glue it, it means that it doesn't depend on the choice of the pair uf I choose for a specific neighborhood of any point in my, in my stack. So in particular, I can find several pairs uf with the same derived critical locus. So for instance, if I want the derived critical locus to be a point, spec c, uh, well, I can take the zero function on the point. But I can do something else. I can do... Uh, a1 with the function x squared, and the critical locus of that is also just a point. Okay, so the first thing I have to check is if I want to be able to say that my invariants here only depend on the critical locus so that I can hope to glue them, I need to look at what they, ha what they do on such things. And if I look at the previous sheaf, uf, so vanishing cycles, well, zero function on a point, this is just a previous sheaf on the point. It's just a complex vector space. This is C. Uh, and if I do what, I look at this and I try to compute it with the way you can compute uh, vanishing cycles, what you're going to get is, well, functions on the zero circle, by that I mean two points, 
over uh, constants. Okay, so I have two copies of C and I mod out by, well, constants, the diagonal. And well, I have two obvious isomorphisms with C, but they are different, right? I can do you know, lambda minus mu or mu minus lambda. Uh, no, or lambda plus, plus mu, I guess. Um, so what I get here is that this here is isomorphic to C, but non-canonically so, and we have two different natural uh, isos. Okay, well still it's isomorphic, that's fine. Can hope to do something. And then I look at MF. Um, so what happens here for matrix factorizations, what you get is, well, you're on a point, the function is zero, so it's just a and b squared to zero. Uh, so it's just a two-periodic complex. Two-periodic complexes. Um, if you try to do that for this, you get something different, actually. And what you get, so I'm not going to give you the computation, but what you find here is equivalent to, well, one periodic complexes. Which means one vector bundle equipped with an endomorphism that squares to zero. And well, those two things are just different. So, okay, uh, this seems to be saying that there's actually no reasonable ground on which I could glue this matrix factorization unless I resolve this problem here. I also have to resolve this problem here in this case. Um, but let me go a bit further first and explain to you what happens. And right, I can do that with more variables if I want, right? So let me do that with A2 and this function. The critical locus is still a point. And what you find here is H1 of the circle, which again, up to a choice of orientation, is isomorphic to C, up to a choice of orientation. So I have two different natural isomorphisms. Um, on this side, Uh, you actually get something that is isomorphic to two priority complexes, but again, in a non-canonical way. And the way you decide here is basically you need, so this is just a quadratic vector space of dimension two, and the data you need to provide such a thing is a maximal isotropic. So the data of a Lagrangian in, well, C squared with the quadratic form. Um, and, well, you have two of them, which are, well, spanned by one i and y minus i. So two choices. Uh, so, well, this accounts for two of the classes I mentioned on, the, on this side. So this question here uh, is resolved by the vanishing of the class alpha. So basically what you need here is to fix the parity of the dimension of the u's you allow. And so this corresponds to the class alpha, this indeterminacy here, the fact that if I just add an a1, I get a different category. Um, and those, all of that, Uh, correspond to the class beta, where you have two different isomorphisms giving you uh, an indeterminacy in H2. The class gamma is, uh, is more complicated. I don't quite know how to um, give it a, a geometric origin, so it might always be zero, as far as I know of. Um, the idea is that, 
So the class gamma, if I look at uh, mf of uf, and if I take uh, L to be uh, a mu2 bundle, okay, so it's a line bundle that squares to, to, to O, then I can take any matrix factorization, I can tensor it with L. And this gives me an automorphism of this category. And this additional automorphism uh, is what gives this class gamma. And again, I don't know where it comes from on the geometric side, so it might always be trivial. I don't know. I doubt it though. Um, okay. So this gives you gamma. Um, okay. Now, there's another source of indeterminacy. Um, which I'm going to mention now, and it has a geometric origin and is going to key, be key in the, in the next section, um, and also the reason for the at least in non-commutative motives, uh, is that, well, you could have uh, automorphisms of UF um, that are the identity on the critical locus. And if they act like that, on UF, and if they act on your invariant non-trivially, then you can't glue. So here what happens is, look at this example. So let me, so I'm going to cheat a little bit and not take a smooth scheme, but a formal smooth scheme. So this is just a formal spectrum. I mean, you could make it in a, a smooth scheme, but it's not. There is a smooth scheme on, the, on, on which it works. So I look at this formal smooth scheme, and I look at the function f um, that is given by x3 plus y to the n, with n greater or equal to 3. And my claim is that there are automorphisms of this thing that fix the critical locus. So the critical locus is a fat point around 0. Um, so it's a 0 locus of, d of, of x squared and, uh, and y n minus 1. Uh, and so you have automorphisms of that. And namely, there's one automorphism that bothers me. Namely, I can do this, and I can do uh, this. So let's do yh, where h is, well, let me write the formula, but it doesn't. Uh, it's just the one that actually gives you something. So it's an nth root of this thing. And it exists because I have taken formal series. Of course, you have an etal neighborhood of 0 in A2 that, where this function also exists. And you can check that this is an isomorphism, an automorphism of this. And it fixes the critical locus. It's the identity on the critical locus. So it has to be the identity on my invariance. Otherwise, I have no hope. And this is not. I mean, this is the one thing we don't know for matrix factorization. I'll come back to that in a minute. So, okay. So, we don't know. Ah. I don't know. Not clear. It's not clear. So, if, if, so the, the, the examples we can compute act trivially, and the examples, well, <laughs> the, the ones we can't compute, uh, yeah, I don't have anything clever to say about them. Um, so, okay. Those are the indeterminacies you have to fix. And the point is that those are the only kind of things you have to actually handle. And this is the main theorem, and it's going to be the statement of the third section. The Darboux stack. Okay, so classically, I mean, Darboux coordinates in, in, uh, in symplectic geometry are, well, coordinates on a symplectic manifold, local coordinates on a symplectic manifold that I identify it with a cotangent bundle. 
Uh, here it's the same thing. We say that double coordinates are just ways to write, sorry, here, uh, my minus one shifted symplectic something uh, as a critical locus. And this is exactly what we do. Uh, maybe, uh, sorry, I should have said here that you assume you reduce, you restrict to M uh, being a derived scheme. Okay, we haven't done the details of uh, extending to derived stacks. Artin stacks, although like formal geometry methods should should do that for you. Uh, so by scheme, you mean uh, it includes uh, the M stack? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. There, yeah, the minimum source stacks are fine. So, I mean, etal descent is fine. Uh, smooth descent is not. Um, so the Darbu stack is going to be, as I was saying, uh, the stack that classifies ways to describe my M as a critical locus locally. Sorry, not X. M. And so, okay, it's something that maps some etal a fine guy S over M to ways of writing S as a derived critical locus. Now, I want this to be a functor. Um, so there's one technical thing here that makes what I said so far a bit uh, not true, which is the fact that in order for that to be actually functorial when I restrict, for instance, to a smaller s, um, I actually need to allow something different here. So actually this guy is going to be a formally smooth formal scheme. And I'm going to ask further that it has the same reduced as my derived scheme itself. Okay, and this allows me to be functorial and to define this thing actually. So that's why this example I gave it with a formal uh, scheme. Right, so, and yeah, so is this something like the stack of double coordinates? So it's a stack on the small etal site of M, uh, but the details are not. Uh, important now. Right, so, okay, I look at the ways I can write my critical locus as a critical locus, I mean, my, my minus one shifted symplectic scheme as a critical locus of something on the left. And what seems to be appearing here is that if I add quadratic variables, um, then I get the same critical locus, which, uh, well, means, in essence, that this stack comes equipped with an action of uh, quadratic bundles. So I'm also going to need this thing, and I'm going to put a nabla here because I need a connection, uh, which is the stack of um, flat, so flat with a flat connection, I mean a quadratic bundles. Uh, and yeah, I mean, always this is going to be non-degenerate. Okay, so what it means is that uh, there's a, a stack of, of things over the Duran, so it maps S as above to something like that, and this guy is equipped with a quadratic form, and this is non-degenerate. Uh, okay, and so I'm telling you that this should act, right? So this is the next statement. And the goal is to describe the quotient. And this really is the main uh, theorem of the paper, really. Um, so why flat? I mean, can, can you make a comment? Yes, yes, uh, I will in a second. I will in a second. Um, so the theorem is that 
this thing acts on the boo stack and, well, uh, the quotient I want it to be contractible, sorry, I forgot my nabla, but it's only true up to A1 homotopy, so something like that. So I take the quotient stack and I impose some form of A1 homotopy invariance, uh, which is to account for this kind of situation, namely this map is not the identity, but if I plug in a little t here, a little t here, and maybe, uh, I don't know, one t here, one t square here, and one t cube here, or something, uh, I have a, an A1 family that deforms this uh, automorphism to the identity. Okay, so as soon as I know that my invariant uh, maps isotopic automorphisms to the identity, to, to, to the same map, uh, I win. So this is why this A1 is here. Uh, of this guy? No, no, you have other ones. But what is true is that every automorphism uh, which satisfies some tangential condition at the neighborhood of a point uh, is isotopic to the identity. So if you know that the, uh, you pick a point in your, particular, in, your, in your particular locus, and if you know that the tangent uh, map at this point is given by a, a matrix with the ones on the, I mean, a block matrix with one, one, and maybe something up there, uh, then it's isotopic to the identity. which is uh, the point of this uh, exactly one. It's saying that the pi one of that is trivial, what I just said. Okay. Uh, yeah, so question of Bertrand. Uh, why do I need flat? Well, to get the action. So the action is given how? Well, if I have, uh, it's also the reason why I need, uh, one of the reasons I need this condition is that I have a quadratic bundle over S Durham, and S Durham is the same as U Durham. So I use the flat connection to extend to a quadratic bundle on U. So I have a map from U, and I have QU, which is a pullback of that. And uh, well, this here, equipped with a function which is F plus Q, is the image of Q and U by the action. Okay, so my action maps, yeah. It takes. Then, then don't you get uh, some bizarre thing that you have all possible flat connections? And, uh, I don't know. So we have to restrict an S that those are actually locally trivial, so that there is a that locally can trivialize both the connection and Q at the same time. Okay. So okay, yes. So there, are some details. there are some details there. Yeah, yeah. We have to ask that. Lo so locally, I could trivialize Q yeah. or trivialize the connection, but not both at once. So we ask that we can. Okay. It's an assumption we add. And locally. Yeah. Um, okay. So what's the point of this theorem? Well, it's a corollary that I should. Uh, is that well, any invariant um, such that well satisfying. Uh, a couple of things, so uh, the first thing is uh, something about being trivial if I apply to some quadratic bundles with a Lagrangian. So this is called Knorr periodicity. I need to have Tom Sebastiani isomorphisms, so what it means is that uh, basically when I apply my invariant to this action, I get an action of the image of whatever I had here. Uh, and one last thing is some weak form of A1 invariance. I mean weak, yeah. It's some weak form, I'm not saying it's a weak condition. It's a weaker form than the one you could, uh, you don't ask that, that if you apply to A1, you get zero, right? Um, 
then if you have that, uh, then glues uh, up to some obstruction classes arising from uh, the action of Q. And I'll give you uh, two examples. Uh, so we'll do two. I'm a bit sad I have to erase something. Um, okay, so example, and the goal is to give you a hint as to what this means and how you get what the obstruction classes are. Uh, so let's do perverse sheaves. Um, okay, so you have this stack of Darbu coordinates, and the point of this stack is that uh, your invariance, sorry, what I, there, over there, uh, can be seen as mapping out of this stack, right? If I have a way to write x as a critical locus, then I actually have an invariant, which is, uh, if I fix a way to write it as a critical locus, if I fix a u and f, I have an invariant. So it means that you have a map of stacks from here to the stack of perverse sheaves on x. And again, this means the thing, like, uh, you forget the drive structure, you identify your good purpose sheets. And you have something that maps uf to p of uf. And that's a map of stacks on the smaller task site. And you have your action of quad. Sorry, x is m. Have I done this a lot? Uh, you have the action of this uh, monoid of quadratic vectors, uh, quadratic uh, bundles. And the point is, what you have to understand, to understand what the obstruction classes are, is what does it act by here. So to say that you have something like that, that would be uh, equivariant, is exactly the Tom Sebastiani condition over there. And what you get here is B mu 2. And the map here is the determinant. So, a quadratic bundle acts on the perverse sheaf by its determinant. And this is your class beta, which I don't know what the color was, but I guess purple. But this accounts for beta. Okay, so there's a uh, the looping thing happening, right? It ends up being a class in H2, even though uh, you have to trivialize this action, essentially. Okay. Now, if I want to do the same thing for matrix factorizations, what's happening? First, uh, sorry, not previous sheaves. I have, so my Stable infinity categories, which are two periodic. <coughs> and what I'm going to have actually is a stack thereof, M. And actually, there's going to be also some flat connection. So, what it means is really a sheaf of two periodic stable infinity categories on the DRAM stack. Um, and Okay, now look at the quadratic action. And, well, to understand what's happening on this side, all I have to do is understand if I have a quadratic bundle, vector space even, what is the image by MF? 
And so it's something like that. And what it actually is, is always, is invertible for the tensor product. So what you have is a version of Azumaya algebras, of derived Azumaya algebras, uh, which are, well, two periodic, because these are two periodic. And again, with a flat connection over M. And those act. And Tom Sebastiani tells me that this is equivariant. Um, so the goal is to, to understand and give you the three classes over there, um, is to understand this stack. And the truth is that this stack is complicated and has an infinite amount of, of uh, homotopy groups, so an infinite amount of abstractions a priori. But what is uh, the trick is that um, the trick is that you actually act by categories that are of two torsion. And what this means is that, so I have my Knorr periodicity, right? So that tells me that if I have a Lagrangian in a quadratic vector space or bundle, then MF uh, is the same as two periodic complexes. And the point is that if I take two copies of a quadratic vector space, I have a kind of Lagrangian, namely the diagonal, maybe one i or something. So, so, you, so, so you need to, to assume that there is a square root of minus one in your base. Oh yeah, it's c. Ah, so you work over c. Ah, we work over c. So some of these things that are not going to work over an arbitrary. No, 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 no. We work over c. Uh, so I mean, part of this also, right? It requires that uh, you can classify that locally every quadratic bundle is of, of this form. Yeah, but for the attack, this is always the case. I mean, you only get yeah, yeah. Um, here, the fact that it goes to two torsion. The fact that it goes to two torsion. Um, yeah, we use i. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We never really. Uh, yeah. C is enough okay. for us for now, but so yeah. Yeah, but I mean, if you want a Lagrangian in x squared plus y squared, you need, you need i. I, mean, yeah. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you need i. You need i. I mean, no, yeah, here, obviously, right? So this is really what's happening, right? You can uh, twist it uh, as much as you want. You need this Lagrangian there. So you need i. Um, but yeah. And uh, when you take this to torsion, then this stack, you can look, you can compute it explicitly. And it has a pi naught, which is, well, Z mod 2. And actually, there's a cross Z mod 2, but uh, it really comes from taking two torsion and doesn't really account, uh, intervene in the gluing in the end, so you can drop it. Uh, you have a cl class in pi 1, which is Z mod 2. And you have a class in pi 2, which is Z mod 2. And then you have 0. OK, and so this gives you my class is uh, alpha, beta. Ah, but these are the statements of all the sheets, so this is a local computation for the attack. That, the that is completely true. Uh, my guess is that uh, all, all, everything should be true of uh, an orbital field. No, but this, this. Uh, this is a computation of homotopy sheets for the attack of the field, right? So yes, but no, you need, you need to have a canonical factorization of the map to two torsion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If the action doesn't factor through the two torsion, I don't see how you how those homotopy groups yeah. could help you. Um, anyway, so that's how you, you get those things. Um, as I was uh, mentioning earlier, so if you look a bit at what's happening, the pi naught here corresponds precisely to those two things, so zero as a quadratic vector space and a1 x squared as a quadratic vector space. So the trivialization of the class alpha is precisely going to fix the parity of the dimension of the user you allowed. Um, the class in pi 1 is this, auto, this, this choice of a Lagrangian here. OK, so it gives you the beta uh, the way I described it. And the class gamma is a thing we don't really know. We know, like when we compute the pi 2 of this guy, we know it's given by this kind of action. But we don't know what it is on the other side. And this is obviously something we want to understand. OK, I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>